Ian T. Masters is our guest here, president of the West Virginia Citizens Defense League. Ian, good to see you. Likewise. I think the last time we had you on, was it on phone? I believe so. The first appearance in the studio? Yep. Yes, it is. Well, very nice. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I've been an attorney, I think, going on about 12 to 13 years now, but I grew up in the northern panhandle of the state, so I heard a little of the... Hoopy. Yeah, I heard a little (laughs) of the Weirton and uh, Pittsburgh stuff going on earlier, but uh, been out here for a few years, and uh, in addition to practicing law, uh, running a little small farm at my place, and parenting, I'm president of the West Virginia Citizens Defense League as well. How did you get involved with the Citizens Defense League? Uh, the fellow who actually created the WVCDO was a couple years ahead of me in law school. And uh, as I got out, it was an issue I certainly cared about. And I was kind of watching from the, the sidelines as, as they really about 10 years ago had their first big break with the preemption law in the state and then uh, saw the way they comported themselves and that they had you know, the ability to make curative institutional change. So I leapt right in and put a shoulder to the stone, was on the board of directors and then vice president and now president. What was your uh, first introduction, even as a young man, to the Second Amendment? Well, I, uh, I was from a family with that that was a tradition and a history from a big military family. I was born in a, a military base in West Germany back in the day. And, uh, back speaking when there was of, a West Germany? Yeah, Hill, yeah. Hillsack or, or Hohenfels? Um, in Lonsdorf, so in, in near, near those areas. But, um, you know, in speaking, as Alonzo mentioned earlier, about you know opening a history book, I think uh, history was my my first major in, in WVU and undergrad. And I think uh, the more averse the person is in history, the more they, they may care about this particular issue. So those are sort of the formative things there. All right, very good. Uh, there was a recent ruling we were just talking about in the commercial break here. I guess it was New Mexico, Matt uh, was telling me, in regard to some emergency powers, and it was uh, overturned, uh, overruled. Uh, do you monitor those sorts of cases closely? 100%. Um, what, what's pretty great about our system is we have these kind of 50 laboratories out there that do positive and negative things, and we pay attention to both. Um, it, as far as it pertains to this scenario in New Mexico, we actually, years back, I think around the Katrina time, where there was also the excuse of using an emergency to try to confiscate firearms or prohibit carry, we have legislation that's at least that old, maybe the year after Katrina, that the state can't use uh, an emergency scenario to do similar things as is happening in New Mexico. Uh, so it, it doesn't impact us here, but it's certainly these are type of things we monitor and, and see if there's any sort of recourse legislatively. Uh, it, does the Second Amendment have any gray area to you, Ian? Is, is, there, is there interpretable uh, stuff in there that uh, um, you think <laughs> could, have, could have been written more clearly? As much legal work as I've done pertaining to the issue, somehow some folks have gray issues. I, I, mm-hmm. I do not. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty simple, black and white, straightforward text. There, but there is even in the legal community, there is so much disagreement on what that amendment means. Sure, right. Sure. So, uh, tell me if you could explain where you think the basis of the disagreement is in the amendment, uh, because there are intelligent people who are on the legal side of this that don't agree with you sure. and. Intelligent discussions can be had, even though this can be a very emotional, passionate issue. So first and foremost, when it comes to law or any sort of political issue, um, a lot of times people just have their opinion and then they're going to interpret it in that light. Um, Some of the things that the kind of my pet issues having to, in our line of work, uh, navigate statutes and understand legal writing is some of the issues with the Second Amendment itself on the federal level. our, Our version is much clearer in our state constitution. But you get phrases, um, it's clearly as the Supreme Court has interpreted an individual right, as it should be, but you get phrases like sort of well-regulated, and people kind of misinterpret that from an historical uh, context where well-regulated meant often used or kept at skill. It didn't mean sort of regulation the way we use it today. It it meant to be kept regular and uh, used and uh, kept in in working order. So there's there's things like that where people sometimes take a modern context to certain words that that can trip them up but but i think a lot of it with this issue as several other hot button political issues is kind of people have the opinions and it sort of colors their light of how they may or not may not read any of the clearest words you could maybe put forward mr perry yeah so i mean you know you guys do a lot of work um writing laws and and you know advocating for them in the state house um is there anything that you guys are are you know moving towards or progressing towards now that that we should kind of look out for or if people want to get involved and join you guys um is there something you're looking at so we uh back when we were created in 2008 or 9 or so had a kind of an omnibus bill drafted of certain issues and we've largely over the last 10 years knocked a lot of them out to be honest we've had a tremendous success 
Um, we've always had a mandate to try to uh, either chip away or, or just eradicate the, the actual gun-free zones in the state and have done a lot uh, with that moving forward. I think some of the other areas, and, and I will caveat this with we have a board of directors that we will certainly meet and we pay attention to national events sometimes as well. Um, but we will sort of meet and what we try to do is look at issues that are left on the table that impact the most amount of West Virginians. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say back to the, the issue of addressing these, these gun-free zones, one of the hot button issues we'll get into, I don't know if it'll be this session or sometime in the future, but is, is addressing something with K through 12 schools. So some sort of system or, or training agency that would permit uh, students or not students, but faculty and staff at K through 12s. I was just hot off of the uh, campus carry bill, so we were able to finally get that as far as students, faculty, and staff with colleges. But I think uh, a lot of folks on our end in particular are kind of sometimes worried about the school safety through K-12. through Other states, uh, Ohio, where I used to practice law way back in the day, um, have just come up with a system that sort of can train and certify certain teachers and, and faculty to carry in school, and it's something we're going to be looking at. But uh, again, will probably become a very hot-button issue. Yeah, no. Absolutely. Uh, I guess just to follow up with that, too, um, you guys also endorse candidates and, yes. and do some of that stuff. So do you guys reach out to them or should they reach out to you guys? Or Because uh, I know some people are starting to hit the campaign trail sure, now. Sure. And, and honestly, we've had myself in particular calls from, from folks in federal office, constitutional office, state's office, sort of uh, we've lengthened the political season a lot over the years. Um, so we, we will put out endorsements. We do grades. We have uh, surveys that we grade on these pretty laborious conference calls for hours going over hundreds <laughs> of surveys. Um, but we are not going to endorse early as some of these folks are. We, we have another legislative session to get through before those elections. And it comes down to kind of these, uh, you know, uh, passing a piece of legislation is kind of a human puzzle where you're dealing with different characters and personalities. And you know, right now, if you endorse someone for governor and they might be the chair of the Judiciary Committee and, and, and uh, you endorse the opponent, it might have uh, some problems. So our, our goal is always to try to get the strongest piece of legislation we can through. So we will probably be slightly just after session or maybe once our bill hits the finish line that we will sort of turn into that mode. But we do spend a lot of time trying to educate folks about uh, electing representatives that reflect their belief in the right to keep and bear arms. And that is a huge part of our organization. Yeah. Matt Harvey. Ian, has the West Virginia Citizens Defense League become a victim of its own success? And by that, I mean um, being able to keep up the momentum from all the different victories. And West Virginia is pretty gun friendly. Sure. That, that's an excellent question. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because th the short answer would be yes. Um, you know, th there's certain years we might have a really great set of legislators elected and, and and to back up, we have a lobby day event every year on President's Day where our members, we bring them down, we divide them up by districts, we get them in front of their uh, elected legislators. And I've, I've certainly noticed over the years of doing this that if, say, a presidential election goes a certain way that's perceived as bad to, the, to gun rights, that we have a massive attendance. But sometimes we have this wide open runway with greater legislators and we have a little bit less folks that show up. So there, there is in this issue a bit of a kind of panic that can happen that will get people off the sidelines. But when you have success year after year passing legislation, there, there can be an apathy we try to fight against to, to address and, and keep people uh, up to task. I think this, this issue that happened in New Mexico certainly sh should help yeah. at least raise awareness that, that you never know when an issue concerning guns is going to spring, a, spring up. 100%. Uh, and again, I, I grew up in the northern panhandle of the state, but now living out here, you know, in the border of Virginia, when we were first created, uh, and largely somewhat patterned after the Virginia Citizens Defense League, at that time, Virginia had much better gun laws than West Virginia at that time. And you can see what happens when elections go on and people maybe aren't as concerned or, or you know, one election can change an awful lot of stuff uh, on, on this terrain and every other terrain. So it's definitely a crucial thing that you have to keep uh, up to speed with and paying attention to going forward. How many members are there in the CDO? We have uh, somewhere, I think, upwards of in between maybe five to 6,000 paid members. Uh, we run a Facebook page as well that I think maybe has 14 or 15,000 in it. But as far as our dues paying kind of members, I think we've got somewhere between five and 6,000. What are the dues? $25 a year. So that just covers a uh, a shirt we put out with our logo that everybody kind of wears at that lobby day event. And then um, just helps us. We don't spend an awful lot of money, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I've had calls from other issue advocacy groups across the, the country that are kind of perplexed. You know, we have 
passed at this point or, or helped pass about 30 pieces of legislation for the right to keep and bear arms and doing that spending not much money. And there's a lot of other organizations that have spent $30 million to get one piece of legislation passed. So we don't spend an awful lot of money. We do a little bit of radio ad work and some other things with media during the session sometimes. But um, that largely the, most of that do kind of goes into getting that shirt mailed out to folks, but we do have a little bit of money we operate with throughout the session. Do you think you can do that on a smaller budget because of basically the culture of the state? 100%. Um, our, our nature, we're, we're also a, a pre, an all-volunteer grassroots organization. So we, we routinely tell people um, we, we care far more about their activism and them paying attention and making the phone calls or coming to lobby day or getting into the legislature, knowing your legislators by the first name basis. We care far more about that than any kind of money, to be honest. So obviously when uh, idiots uh, misbehave with guns, it gives all good gun owners a bad name in the in the media uh, do you any any advocacy or work to try to keep the guns away from those who should never be around one sure so we uh are, especially with our membership but we try to sort of partly an educational organization for the entire state but we certainly uh hold our, our folks to high account at our lobby days i mean we are uh, always revered as sort of one of the more respectful groups down there but uh, education is a large part of what we kind of do with, with firearm safety or, or sort of uh, ha- helping people understand the law, to be honest. So sometimes maybe not even complete tragic idiot kind of moments, but sometimes, you know, it's not a good look for anyone even to be arrested for something they didn't know was against the law or, or, or was legal. So we spent a lot of time actually doing education um, with this campus carry bill that passed. We're going to be doing some more events just sort of on campuses throughout the state to explain the ins and outs of that particular legislation because – we have just as much a vested interest as WVU or these other universities as making sure that that goes smoothly. I, I know that they've uh, advocated for laws to, to be put on the books to punish people who are misusing guns. The, mm-hmm. the Citizens Defense League, they've done that in the past. So when I was a kid, and I'm 60, so that goes back a ways, but it was not uncommon for kids to hunt when they were kids. and. Uh, kids would come to school with pickup trucks and you know shotgun racks on the pickups. And back in those days, it was not uncommon to see that. And it wasn't a big deal. The, the kid's truck would be in the parking lot, and afterward, it was understood that they were going, going out. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, just outside the city, but southwestern Pennsylvania is a pretty rich hunting area, so you don't have to drive all that far sure. to do a whole lot of hunting. Uh, that's not the case any longer. And if you went anywhere now near a school with a gun, there, you're going to have a lot of problems. Okay, but the culture of the country has changed tremendously as well. And I don't know how many kids at a young age are getting the appropriate education in terms of the handling of a gun. I don't know how many ten-year-olds or twelve-year-olds sure. are going out hunting with their grandpa anymore, or their dad or their uncles or whatever. Do you think that that has that changing of that culture has harmed? families uh, in, in the overall gun culture in the country? I do to some extent. Uh, as I was sort of introducing my background again, I, I was around firearms at a pretty early age, uh, really strictly learned how to, to give them the respect they require and, and to keep safe and, and to operate them safely. So I do think that some of that's happened as, as the, the country has become more of a sort of an urban and less rural environment. Um, it, it's something that, uh, you know, there's a lot of times that people go a long time sometimes in their lives without encountering a firearm that kind of adds to sort of the hysteria and the fear to these things when they simply are tools that can be used for ill or for positive. And uh, I think it does. I think it's something, particularly in this country or in this state, uh, something we as, as parents or just, just people in general need to, to work with is to try to, you know, I always kind of say that it's you don't necessarily uh, – gunproof a firearm you, you sort of uh, gunproof the child you, you basically teach the children how to how to be respectful that these things are serious that they they can be uh used and, and maintained safely and teach folks how to do that what do you think is an appropriate age to begin education i i, uh, I wouldn't be arrogant enough to necessarily to put a, a button on that i know i have an eight-year-old son that um we, we haven't gotten into a lot of shooting or anything at this point but he's familiar with what firearms are that they are, are dangerous things not to be touched or, or moved and he uh understands that so again he's sort of more of a gunproof child than a than a childproof gun so he he understands those things and, and i would uh advocate that for for anyone that's a, a firearms owner uh to do so I know this is not your specialty, but I'll ask anyway because there are a whole lot more kids now that grow up playing games where you can shoot a thousand Nazis in ten seconds and 
uh, <laughs> what, you know, whatever. And, and uh, I, I remember talking to Tom Malay Jr. on this program about doing some shooting classes with, a, uh, well, I guess some parents brought their teenager in and the kid had never handled a real gun before but was very proficient at it and asked, how did you get to be so good with a gun if you never handled one? He said, video games. So I'm wondering if, you're, if you think, if you're of the side that advocates that all of this shooting and killing that these kids are doing playing video games at a young age leads to a desensitization of these children. So we see more of these kind of incidents that take place in schools, uh, in public and whatever. And so many times you look and you're looking at the kid going, how the heck, where, where would you even get that idea? So I, I certainly think there are probably some broader social issues as far as school shootings and other issues outside of just uh, video games. But uh, it, it is interesting that, uh, you know, I'm back to being a bit of a history nerd, uh, largely a collector of sort of older firearms and different uh, war relics and stuff. And it is funny, you'll catch sometimes 12 year old kids that come over and they recognize this particular German pattern rifle from World War One and these these type of things. So it's certainly a level of familiarity. Again, I would uh, sort of advocate more of a, a kind of sit down and hands on approach of how to sort of navigate a firearm safely. But uh, yeah, I, I would think that the ills that, that we sort of see are maybe a little larger than just video games. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. But I, I do wonder, uh, and I know people say, well, when I was a kid, I did this, I didn't, I didn't cause me to go out and do that. And that's true. For most of us, it is. But for some of us, I wonder, because if you just grow up, and your whoever your parent or guardian it is, is just letting you spend 10 hours a day shooting stuff blowing nazis away and zombies on your computer or your your console or whatever i i don't know i i had that it's got to have some kind of an effect on some people alonzo you're shaking I mean, your head no well no i mean nobody probably thinks you know i'm like the the model child of you know the world <laughs> or anything but i mean i grew up uh playing these video games yeah. you know i used to um i joined the army you know because i liked that kind of call of duty you know type stuff so i don't think it it, it raises any type of negative effect i think ian titton the um the nail on the head when he says that there's other social implications that are taking place to kind of you know create that type of behavior. there are because but, it's but, but don't they call don't you know, they kind of all go into this the pot of stew that that comes out with somebody eventually i just don't having i have that I, moment I, I, you don't, I don't think, think it's, it's all a it's factor weighed. Um, I don't think it's it's weighted heavier in uh, the actual cases that you're you're seeing that this is popping up. You know, there's a trend in the behaviors and the the, the warning signs and recognition that um, you know there's a greater correlation in that sense than I I would believe you know it to be just from video game playing. Well, I mean, think well, about I'm, the I'm rate, by no means putting 100 percent responsibility on the video game. Oh no, I, and I understand that. Right. I just I feel like the volume of people that are you know playing video games and stuff, the amount of numbers of people that are actually you know um, from a young age going up playing video games, we're not seeing the scale of, of shootings directly correlated from that. It's well, one we, of those but things. We're certainly where, seeing but it more makes shootings, them, But it makes them better at doing it when when something else pushes them over the edge. Would you agree with that? I I wouldn't I wouldn't because even you know a, a a real scenario in comparison to a video game there's some things you can't simulate you know and uh, I think if you've ever had to you know answer a a, a a call like that like I I worked at the hospital and I know that that seems like kind of silly but I was an armed security officer and I've responded to you know multiple calls of someone having a gun in the parking lot someone you know doing um, certain types of behavior and when you're actually, you know, in that situation and that scenario and the adrenaline's kicking and you just kind of go in this like tunnel vision mode, it's it's there's nothing that you can simulate to to basically say that, you know, a video game can construct the types of behavior that's necessary for you to take, you know, uh, certain actions. Um, I think with those kids, um, you know, a lot of them take the coward's way out when they're confronted with someone that's, you know, trained and stuff. It's it's not the same type of... Uh, so what you're telling us is, like, to make your point, you don't see a lot of people going in Martin's grocery store with a sword smashing fruit. Like, yeah. Because, because everybody plays <laughs> yeah. Fruit Ninja. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. It's, it's, it's a much different... I saw Gallagher once, and I wanted to take a sledgehammer to a watermelon when I yeah. went to the supermarket. I did. Yeah. Uh, but Ian, you didn't. I didn't. 
I didn't because you chickened out. I was I was trained at a young age. A sledgehammer is a dangerous <laughs> object, and you use it responsibly. And fruit is delicious. I'm Italian. My family's in construction. You know, I think I think um, what would be very helpful is for young children to you know fire to shoot sure. a gun. They should be introduced to that, and. I'm going to do this with my daughter when she gets old enough. I I want her to har- harvest an animal, sure. So she'll have to appreciate what goes into it, and so she will be less wasteful with with food. And there's a certain respect mm-hmm. that you gain by having to kill an animal. One thing I'll say, um, and I 100% agree with you there, Matt. But um, one thing I would say, and this is back to the opportunities too. So train or so uh, familiarize folks with with firearms one of the things we're looking at and i think this is going to take a long time to really untangle and figure out but back to the idea of of kind of having a bit more urban population or less sort of folks that own 20 acres that can shoot on is we have some real hopes we have to fight tooth and nail sometimes to keep public ranges open throughout the state we don't have a lot of them don't get brad Knoll started um but it's something that I would certainly want to to expand and sort of look at because uh, we do need more opportunities even to, to do those kind of things. I mean, hunting is certainly one of them and one we have great tradition with in the state, but uh, would like to see more opportunities there for folks to do that if they were inclined. Where's the... Where's we'll the just make this a quick one. We've got 30 seconds. Where's the lo- the closest local or public range? That's a good question. I think there is a one, a partial one out at Sleepy Creek, the wildlife management area, but uh, I'm not certain of some of them in this, this neck of the woods. I have a little bit of my own property I can shoot on, so I haven't had to use them out this way. 